morning. How's everybody getting along this morning? Beautiful spring morning. Yes, it's good to be in God's house this morning, is it not? I sure think so. I was getting concerned about my uh, brother there, Tater. I thought he wasn't going to show up today because I had to say a little something about him this morning. It, uh, Friday, oh, not Friday, I'm sorry, well, I was coming down out of Boone, down 421, and I was there getting close to the stoplight there at Lowe's Food and all that deal. And I kind of look over and I see a yellow truck. I said, hmm, pulled up a little bit, eased up. There was my brother Tater. We conversed back and forth a little bit. And his buddy, I don't know who his buddy was, but he was getting me just down the road, Keith Mitchell stuff. But I pulled off and it dawned on me. I said, you know, something just ain't right here. I said, there sits my brother Tater in a Ford pickup truck and I'm driving this old Chevrolet truck. This just ain't right. <laughs> and it made me realize and got thinking though about Today in church, and they're thinking about how, you know, where are we at? Are we in the right place? Are we where we should be, you know? And over in uh, Genesis, chapter number 3, and verse 8, the Bible says, And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden, and in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord amongst the trees of the garden. We think, well, what in the world has that got to do with church? Well, it's just like this. Do you think Adam and Eve was where they're supposed to be? If there's a hiding over in the garden somewhere behind the trees because God's presence was coming through the garden, they should have been in God's presence. But instead, they're hiding themselves because they had sin in their life. That's what they're doing. Well, it got me to study and think a little bit about it. And I realized in my study here that the latest dec- or epidemic, pandemics come out. Have you heard about it? The latest one out here? It's not the newest one, but it's the latest one. It's called Morbius Sabbaticus. I assume that's Latin. I don't know, but it's more commonly known as Sunday sickness. And see, some of the parts of it, though, I mean, the good news is it's never lasts more than 24 hours, okay? And you don't lose your appetite with it. That's good, right? It don't affect your eyes because you still pick up the paper and read it, and you can still watch television, right? So that's a good thing. It don't affect your eyes. But the bad thing about it is no doctor's ever called about it. I'd say this morning the great physician needs to be called about it, but no doctor's ever called when you got Morbius sabbaticus. But you can, unfortunately, after a few attacks, Chris, it can become chronic. And it can become an epidemic in your life. And it can even become terminal. But you usually have no symptoms on Saturday, you see. Saturday you're doing real good. And you get up on Sunday morning, you've slept well, you just wake up feeling refreshed, you eat a big breakfast, but then unfortunately, it starts. It stinks feeling real good. Well, if you sit down a little while, first thing you know about lunchtime, dinner time, Mary, guess what? You get to feel a whole lot better. I believe it's going away, Chris. I believe I feel good, uh, good enough now. I can probably get me some dinner. And I think maybe I can watch a couple of football games on TV. I think, well, maybe I can get out and walk around. I might see Chris up on the Lloyd Ridge Road and I get to talk to him for a little while. But unfortunately, sometimes it relapses. If there happens to be Sunday night service, you have a real short relapse. But it's all right. You'll get better. Because come Monday morning when you're rushing yourself to work, everything's all right then. You're good to go. You're good to go. Morbius sabbaticus. But you know, put up uh, 3314 Exodus right quick. There's hope for that, though. And he said, my presence shall go with thee, and I'll give thee rest. God's presence going with us through the week. He might be able to help us with that disease, might he? I like the desire of, you know, over in... Uh, Psalms 27 and 4. One thing I have desired of the Lord that I will seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. Well, how can you inquire if you're not in his presence? How can we behold his beauty if we're not in his presence? We need to be in his presence. That will be the desire of our heart. 
But over in Acts, I think it's cure for the, that Morbius Sabbaticus. I keep reading that back there. Repent ye therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. Who but God can blot out your sins this morning? Who but convert him from your sins? Repent this morning is what we need. The world's not going to be in this church, guys. I mean, unfortunately, we, 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 we try. We try to go out and try to woo them in. But right now we're speaking to the church. It's, it don't affect unsaved people. This is affecting saved people. It affects those people that should know better. But amazing this morning, every one of y'all somehow didn't come down with that sickness this morning. Ain't that amazing? We're in God's house this morning. I thank him this morning. I've heard people as they get older, you know, they get troubles and things, and they can't come to church, and the desire of their heart is to be in church. The privilege we have to be in church. We're healthy, our hearts beating. We may be a little lake or whatever, but we're here. Why do we let these opportunities that God gives us slip away time after time when we can be in the presence of our Savior? I hope you don't come down with it. I really hope you don't come down with it. Because I'm telling you right now, you think it was a pandemic. There's a pandemic right now going on in church. Look around. Where's everybody at? Thank God you're here. And I bet Roger Elmore's got a message for us. going to burn a hole in us. And I hope it does. Because today we can behold the beauty of our Savior and what he's done for us in the presence of him for our entire life, each and every day. So now let's get ready for church. Sunday school teachers are ready to teach this morning. They're rared up and ready to go. But they've got to have somebody to teach. Preachers fired up ready to preach. But he needs somebody to preach too. And to the world, they need to see, by example, what we do and what's really important in our lives. Because you'll show what's important. You really will. Prayer requests this morning. Let's pray in for Sunday school teachers getting ready to stand and teach. Mackie, she brings children to church. Preacher Roger, we're praying for you too. Anything else, we're going to pray. We're going to Sunday school. We need to thank him for the opportunity up there, don't we? John, uh, John Paul, will you leave, sir? Will you? Good morning. Um, if you want to find your places, uh, and go ahead and mark John 14 and Romans chapter 5. All right. Anybody got any prayer requests to mention uh, before we get started? If not, uh, Taylor, you care to pray for us? All right. Uh, so today we've been in the previous lessons. We've been hearing from Greg and uh, learning in James about faith in action, faith on display, love uh, being an attribute that should be seen in a Christian. And so that led me to a question and uh, a challenge question to myself and I hope uh, it'll be a challenge to you also, but do you love me? And we know that question is famous uh, from when Jesus asked Peter, do you love me, the three times. And, of course, in that case, Jesus gave a specific, uh, specific job to Peter and told him to feed the sheep. But this, going back here to John chapter 14, I wanted to start there in verse 8, and uh, Philip asked a question here. Uh, Philip saith, or Philip made a statement to him here. Philip said uh, unto him, Lord, show us the Father, and it sufficeth us. Jesus saith unto him, Have I been so long time with you, and yet hast thou not known me, Philip? He that hath seen me hath seen the Father. And how sayest thou then, Show us the Father? Believest thou not that I am in the Father, and the Father in me? The words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself. 
but the Father that dwelleth in me. He doeth the works. Believe me that I am in the Father, and the Father in me, or else believe me for the very works' sake. Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that believeth on me, the works that I do, he shall do also. And greater works than these shall he do, because I go to my Father. And whoever, um, I mean, and whatsoever ye shall ask in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If he shall ask anything in my name, I will do it. If ye love me, keep my commandments. And I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever, even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but ye know him, for he dwelleth in you, and shall be in you. And I will not leave you comfortless, I will come to you. Yet a little while, and the world seeth me no more. But ye see me, because I live, ye shall also you shall live also. At that day ye shall know that I am in my Father, and ye in me, and I in you. He that hath my commandments uh, and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me. And he that loveth me shall be loved to my Father, and I shall love him, and will manifest myself to him. And so what I was thinking about here was Philip asked the question to see the Father. He wanted to see the Father. And what I loved about the answer that Jesus gave to him was he was telling him that you've seen him in me. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And what Jesus went on to elaborate on was is that it's the works that he was doing that showed the Father. Now, Jesus actually is deity. You know, we're not deity. I mean, of course, you know, he, he really is the Son of God. So he was working the works of God. But I love what he said was is that um, the ones that believe on him, the ones that follow him, they'll do works also. And he was saying that we could ask in his name and that we would do uh, greater things. And what I loved about this was I believe that this has been taken way out of context in a lot of cases where people think that they can just ask, you know, whatever, and it's just going to happen. You know, it's, it's the ideology of I just, whatever I do, as long as I got enough faith, it'll just happen. And the problem with that is you're assuming that your will is in perfect alignment with God's will. Now, when your aligned will is in line with God's will, you can do incredible things because it's not your will that's being accomplished, but his will. And when it's done for his will and for his glory to reveal him, that he may be, get all the honor, Christians can do amazing things. And so what I loved about this was he gave them a challenge, though, also here in uh, verse 15. It's kind of the one that challenged me. If you love me, keep my commandments. And so I thought about this was, you know, this is a, talking to a Christian audience here. This is talking to an audience of folks that believed in him. And um, the keeping of the commandments. Now, I think this could actually be misunderstood also. I think there's, you know, I, well, yesterday at the Apple Festival, I had some individuals uh, try to tell me about their version of religion. And it's uh, based on some verses from Acts that are really twisted and Anyway, I, I, they've kind of got an idea like this that it's, you know, it's not just grace. You're not saved by faith, grace through faith, but it's, you know, believe this, but then we've got to do all these other things, you know. That, that's, that's their basis of system. The problem with that is that's not grace. You know, it's grace and faith, and really faith is not a, a big thing. I mean, we, we kind of build faith up like faith is like this huge force. Really faith, you know, it's, it's just a little thing. Faith says, I believe the Word of God. Faith is, is what it takes to just believe. And, and really, that's not doing a lot. That's not really not doing anything. When we just believe what the Word of God says and then act upon it, then I'm trusting God to supply the power. I'm trusting God to fulfill His Word. I'm not doing anything. I'm just trusting and just acting on what He said. So when it said, keep my commandments, what I mean by misunderstanding is this is not talking about keeping the law. This is not talking about keeping a perfect law. In Christ, you have perfect positional righteousness with God. He fulfilled the law. But I said, keep my commandments. So as I studied it out and I uh, found some places, um, one thing about Jesus' commandments is, Matthew, Jesus gave us some commandments to follow as Christians nowadays. And in Matthew 22, verses 34 through 40, You'll find it says, but when the Pharisees heard, had heard that he had 
put the Sadducees to silence. Uh, they were gathered together. Then one of them, which was a lawyer, asked him a question, tempting him and saying, Master, what is the great commandment in the law? Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind. And if you read it in Mark, you'll see the word strength there also. And then 38 says, This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like unto it, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. So what I was thinking about here was Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. So I t what I take that to mean is, and for a Christian, if you want to keep the, all the commandments of God, then in Christ, love God with all your heart, with all your soul, mind, and strength. And these are not necessarily individual pieces, but it's saying that with everything that is in you, every bit of you, everything you own, everything that you are, everything that you think, Love God with everything that you're made up of first. And in doing that, you're going to get your will in line with his. Because when it's about him, when it's all about him, and it's not about me, then my will becomes his will. And his will is what needs to be getting done because his will is for salvation. His will was to save sinners. His will is to redeem this creation. His will is to bring us into his kingdom into real perfection in his presence. That's his will. And his will needs to be accomplished, not mine. Now, the second part about that is it's going to be easier to fulfill the whole law and do the second part of that when you got the first part of it right. If we don't have the first part of it right and our will's not towards God and towards his glory and all about bringing him glory and honor and doing his will, then the second part's going to be real tough because we're going to be worried about ourselves. But it says love your neighbor as yourself. So when we're living in, in, our, in a place of total uh, dependence on God. We're living in a place where everything we're doing is seeking to love, honor, and glorify the Father. When that's our heart's desire, then we love others as ourselves. which means in that case we want to tell them about what the Word of God says. We don't want to leave them in error. We don't want to let them continue in a path of destruction. And that's showing love. The world out there says that love is somehow this uh, idea of making somebody feel better. Or you... Uh, affirm somebody or I've got a cousin that's uh, mixed up in some just I mean it's just foolishness what it is and the bad thing is that she's got a boyfriend that's really close to her and the problem is even though he has her ear and he's a decent fella he won't rebuke her for this foolishness that she's in it does upset me because she just tunes out everybody else and uh, you know she thinks everybody's just against her and it just aggravates me when I see somebody that's got somebody's ear but you just won't take that advantage. you won't take that opportunity and, and so what I'm trying to say is, how is that love, is what I'm asking. You know, the world says that you just affirm somebody, let them be how they are, you know, ease their mental burden, let them enjoy, you know, be whatever, you know, go along, get along, that kind of stuff. How is that love? I'd just love somebody to explain it to me. How is it love? Because ultimately what you're going to do is you're going to let that cut them off from the Word of God. You're going to let it cut them off from the people of God. You're going to let them cut it off. Eventually it's going to cut them off from God. I mean, it, it, you, you, we can't continue living in this worldly system and living in sin and ever be in the presence of God. Sin for a Christian even. So a Christian, one that's been uh, heard the gospel, believed the gospel, repented and believed the gospel, and then goes back it falls into sin, it'll cut you off in fellowship. Sin is a horrible thing. I mean, it, we, we see it laid out so much in Scripture. Anything that's sin will cut you off from the Father. It'll keep you from seeing Him. It, it'll, it'll keep you from uh, living in that peace that, you can, uh, uh, that God will give. When your mind is stayed on him. So what I'm trying to say is, you know, the first one, love the Lord your God with everything that's in you. And then love your neighbor as yourself. The first thing in loving the neighbors, those that are around us, we need to correct them in a loving way. When, they're in, when somebody's in error, we need to show them that the word of God says that this is wrong. It's not my opinion. It's not what I want. It's not what I think. But I need to, you know, when we see our neighbors in error, we need to let them know, you know, this is not right. This is not going to lead to a good end. That is showing love. And then what we can do is, that's why I wanted to bookmark Romans chapter 5, we can tell them something greater though. When they realize, when we tell people about sin, we need to tell them about the solution. Romans chapter 5 is where you can tell of what the Lord has done to remedy that problem. Because ultimately a person can't love God. If, all the, if you come to somebody and you just tell them they're, they're, they're a sinner, you just tell them they're going to die and go to hell, you just tell them, I mean, if you tell them all the truths that the Bible reveals about people that live in sin and people that are sinners that are cut off from God, 
I don't think that the human condition is going to have much love for God in that way. I would say that it's probably going to cause a hardened heart. It's probably going to cause anger and, and uh, uh, fear. But here's the thing I love. We can take them over in the book of Romans, and we can show them then, like Romans 5 says here, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And there it is. There's your solution. People lost in sin, the world lost in corruption, you can have peace with God. And now what I'm trying to say here is if we as Christians are not living a lifestyle that has God first, if we're not living a lifestyle that, that seeks to honor him with everything that we are, if we're not loving God with all our heart, soul, mind, spirit, strength, if we're not loving him with everything that we are, and we're not living in this peace, this real peace, not the people walking around with the, the weird smiles on their face and, you know, that, that peace that they build up in their religious motives. But I'm talking about when we walk in peace, the peace that God gives, that even when we're in these times of storms and tribulations and trials, you have peace, when that, that kind of peace. When we walk in that and we show people that that's real as Christians, you have something to, you have a te powerful testimony then. you got something that's real, something that they can't argue against, something that they say, how can they endure this? And live in this peace because it don't come from us. It don't come from within. It's something that comes from outside. And we have it by faith through the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's ultimately where everything ought to revolve and center around in our gospel message. It ought to revolve around Christ. Everything's around him. His atoning sacrifice, his propitiation, everything is around Christ. And just to make another example out of that fellow talking to me yesterday, that was the problem with their gospel. Their gospel was a work-centered gospel. They promised peace. They promised uh, ease of life. You know, all this stuff that sounds good to the human ear, community, love, fellowship, all this stuff they promised revolved around works, revolved around, you know, they don't tell you to repent of sin. They would tell you to repent of uh, your occupation. Apparently, you know, your job in the capitalist society, that's, you know, a problem. Apparently, you can't use that for the glory of God, you know, because it's wicked. So they don't tell you to repent of sin, repent of your occupation, you know, because ultimately it's kind of interesting. They don't want you to give away the money, you know, they want to give that to them. But anyway. So I, anyway, anyway, the point I'm getting at is not to get too far off, but that's other religion. Other religion, it revolves around works. It revolves around self. It revolves around, I got to do this, I got to do this. No, it's God working in us. And that's what I love about Jesus over in John 14. He told them about that. It was the Father working in him. And then as we are connected to the Father through the Son, he, then we work the works of God. When our lives are linked with Him, then we do the things that God wills. And we do it according to how He would receive glory. Even if, like the examples we see from the apostles, you suffer for it. Even if doing what God, has, according to His will, even if you, you do what He wants you to do according to His will, it brings you suffering, He still gets glory from it. I mean, one thing I thought was amazing is I saw a book about the martyrs. And I'm amazed at how it just gave me so much more confidence and assurance about the message of the gospel. That these men endured what they endured back in, the, back in history for the sake of preaching the gospel. Uh, I read a place where Mark was drug around behind a cartwheel. I mean, a cart on the streets. I mean, just they drug him around. He didn't die the first day. And they put him in a, uh, a, a prison cell and drug him around the next day. And the next day it actually killed him. And I, you know, I, I read about these, these traditions that they had of how the apostles endured these things. And none of them defected. I mean, they, they endured these things. How? How could a person just endure something like that? It was God giving them that strength within. Because they were sold out completely for his glory. Everything they did, even if it's getting drugged behind a cart, wheel, or a cart through the streets on cobblestones, they were willing to endure it for the glory of God. And, I mean, I just say, everything that they did, they, they loved him with everything that was in, within them. Everything. But then we go on in Romans here, by whom we also have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in the hope of glory, the glory of God. It's what we hope in. It's what keeps us going. We hope that even though in this world we may endure tribulations and hardships, sickness, things that don't make sense, and maybe sometimes we're doing everything we think we're supposed to be doing. Maybe we're, we are praying up like we need to. We're studying. We're reading. We're in close fellowship with God. We're at church. Maybe we look around life and we say we're doing everything. And something happens. It's just unreconcilable. I mean, in, in those moments, that's where we have to just rely on him. 
Rely on Him. That He's going to give you grace to endure through that. And then rejoice in the hope of glory. The hope that one day it's all going to be set right. My mind goes back to Job a whole lot of times. When Job, um, the Bible talks about he uh, served the Lord perfectly, you know, and then later on endured all that. But I love how in that, Job's hope was that at the last day he was going to see his Lord. He knowed his Redeemer lived. Keep that in your mind, Christian. I mean, that's what we're looking for. We ain't looking for worldly gains down here. And while we may have things down here that we would love to see changed and things to see better, but ultimately just remember that it's the kingdom to come in that new creation. The hope of the glory of God is what we're, we're hoping in, what we're rejoicing in, what we're always looking forward to. And then to go on here, we can tell them also, and not only so, but we glory in tribulations also, knowing that tribulation worketh patience, and patience experience, and experience hope, and hope maketh not a shame, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost which is given unto us. For, which, for when we were yet without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet peradventure for a good man some would even dare to die. But God commended his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And as we go through these verses here, if you get down to that point right there trying to explain to somebody, I don't know how they can't see the love of God. And if, if we, you know, talk about that in tribulations. In tribulations, if we as Christians can live a, a life that says, I'm all, everything I'm doing is for the glory of God. Sola Dea Gloria is how they used to do it in Latin. All for the glory of God. When we live that kind of lifestyle, loving him with everything that we are, and then loving our neighbors also with a sacrificial love that says my goal in life, my goal, my, what I want to see happen is God be glorified. Uh, and in, in salvation, God is glorified. When a sinner turns from his old sinful ways and glorifies God, we see God being glorified. God's glorified in that. He purposed from before the foundation of the world to create this great salvation plan for his ultimate glory. He set man up in perfection. He set man up in a place that was uh, uh, ideal. Everything man could ever want gave him one simple choice, and man chose wrong. Man chose wrong. But I love how God in his great mercy and grace, and, and ultimately for his glory, chose to do it the way he done it. I love it. I mean, I just when I, the more I learn about it, the more I love it. Man fell, and, and a lot of people may dispute about things of, uh, you know, well, what if they hadn't, what if they, well, I like how one fellow said it, you know, they did. <laughs> and so that, you know, ultimately, that's how the Bible said they did. And, and God knew they was going to always. So then, you know, there's our answer if people want to know background, you know, when we're witnessing, if people want to know background, why is everybody a sinner? Well, you know, we can go to the first three chapters of the Bible and there's your answer. You know, I mean, that's, that's what God said. But when we endure tribulations, when we endure, the, the reason things are like they are is now when we endure these things, when we endure the, the, the trials, the tribulations, the suffering, the, whether it be physical, mental, financial, whatever it might be, we, when we suffer and go through tribulations, but we, through it all, we do it with patience. We learn experience. As we go through that, we get more experienced as we do that more and more. And that experience produces more hope. And I'm just saying, I, th I think what, he, what this is meaning here is that it's talking about a growing process. Endure tribulations, learn patience, gain experience, and all that is producing hope. And what I love about this one phrase here is that hope maketh not ashamed. This is the one that just stuck with me right here. Hope maketh not ashamed. What I love about this is, is that you're not going to be ashamed in the end. You're not going to be put to shame because God's not going to let you down. He's faithful who's promised. He's faithful. He's proven it so many times. Every day that we see the sun come up, run its course, and go back down, and all of nature and creation is still sustained, we see his faithfulness. He's been doing that every day for years and years and years and years. I, it struck me one morning when I woke up, I was thanking God for my breakfast, and I thought, a thought struck me that I have never been hungry a day in my life in 28 years. I ain't been hungry a day in my life that I didn't choose to be. I mean, and I'm saying just a testament to his faithfulness. I mean, if he don't give the increase, it don't matter how much we scratch around the ground. And I just, his faithfulness. But he, hope maketh not ashamed. No matter what you endure, and no matter what trials and tribulations you have to go through, do it for the glory of God and in it rest in him and trust 
that he's going to give you peace to get through it. It's as long as your goal and your will is to bring him glory in it. Trust in that. And he's not going to make you ashamed because he's not going to allow his name to suffer reproach. He's not going to. He leads us in the pathways of righteousness for his name's sake. He's going to lead us uh, in a path as one of his children in a way that would bring honor and glory to him. And so we can endure things knowing that hope maketh not ashamed. We're not going to be ashamed in the end for serving him. Because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost. And I love this part here, though. That fella just mentioned it once more. This is one thing I thought was just really tragic about their doctrine. They, don't, they never once mentioned the third person of the Godhead. They talked really favorably about the Father and the Son, but they denied, as far as I could tell, they denied the Holy Spirit. And, and here's another one. We can't do this on our own. We can't do and fulfill those two commands. Love the, God, love, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, strength. And love your neighbor as yourself. A man cannot do that in himself. In fall and corruption form, a man can't do that. They can make false forms of it, and they can do what they think, and they can alter the scriptures and make doctrines to, to make it look like they're doing these things. But you can't do it the way the scripture wants us to do it, in that self-sacrificing way. Not caring about self at all, but all about the glory of God. You can't do it that way without the Holy Spirit. And he, it's him that works in us, and he's to shed that love in us. Now, all that being said is, in living that self-sacrificing way towards others, seeking the profit of others above our own, in living that life willfully, that is, you know, uh, there's a lot of socialism being spread around now too, and that ain't, the Bible ain't teaching socialism neither. I mean, you know, the reality is, is that this is a free will thing. This is something a person does individually, not a mandated thing from the government. But when you choose to be a cheerful giver, when you choose to meet the needs of others, when you make that choice that you could keep everything for yourself, you could live, I mean, you know, I'm just saying if a man works for something, he deserves it. He's earned it if he works for it. And I, I believe that capitalism, free market, I believe in all that. But I'm saying that what's beautiful about that system is that I have the choice. I can work and honestly labor with my hands and earn wealth, and then I can make a choice that while I could keep it, no, rather... I'm going to give it for the honor of God. I'm going to give it for the glory of God. I'm going to make a choice to do it, and they're going to know why. I'm not doing it because of law or a mandate, because I live under grace. And I'm going to do it because I want to, because I want my Lord to receive glory and honor out of it, not under compulsion, not out of fear, but out of free will and out of a cheerful heart. Uh, we can give and meet the needs of others. And then I love this because in doing so, in my last point here, verses 6 through 8, in doing so, when we live in a self-sacrificial way, all for the glory of God, we do imitate the motives I believe we see for God saving sinners, is that he was still holy. God could choose to save everyone. He could save, choose to save someone, or he could choose to save no one, and he would have been just as holy, just as righteous, just as worthy of praise as he was before him. But what I love about this is here, for when we were yet without strength, <laughs> there's your works-based salvation. I don't know what you're going to do with that, but yet without strength. I mean, I, I couldn't, I got no strength. I can't do it. In due time, the set time, according to God's plan, Christ died for the ungodly. Died for the ungodly. Didn't have to. He had every right to just stay there in the presence of the angels, glorifying him day and night, still worthy of it. But he chose to die for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man, we know this from human wisdom, for scarcely for a righteous man would one die. Yet for adventure, maybe, maybe for a good man would one lay down his life. But the last part here, but God and his unselfish, the unselfish love of God, I mean, the unselfish love of God here, but God commendeth his love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. I mean, I just, that's one of my favorite verses. I can't get over that verse. That's my challenge. That's, that's the verse I'm taking, you know, from this. I, 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 if I say I love him, let me, keep my, let me keep his commandments. Let me truly live a lifestyle that says I love him. Don't let me just say it with my mouth. 
Don't let me just love in word, but let me lo love in deed. Let me love in what I do. Let me make a choice that while I have a right to keep my possessions, I have a right that I could keep the things I've worked for and earned, but let me show a different way. Let me say that while, yes, I have a right to keep it, instead, I want to willfully give it. I want to willfully give my time, my resources, my affections, because I love my Lord, and I want to do His will. I want to see His will accomplished, because I want to see others saved, because I want to see others come to know Him, and I want to see others glorify Him, and I want to be there at that last day to see Him crowned King of Kings, to see everything put underneath him and him put in his frightful place. To see everything and all things declare him Lord to the glory of God the Father. Because he's so worthy and deserving of it. Let us work towards that day, towards that goal. With that mindset of loving God and loving our neighbors.